Bitcoin solves an actual problem. Satoshi Nakamoto left really early. For startups and new businesses, actually the founders have to do all the work in the beginning. But yeah, when you compare that to Satoshi, who left very, very early on, it's actually pretty incredible. I never thought about that uh, before. It should not work in that way. For the philosophy of what Bitcoin could be, he had to go. And then after that launch, I was like, damn, I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm working at a bank. I'm working at a goddamn bank and I'm participating in a system. I have a mortgage. And I have a bank account and I'm, I'm participating in a system that I truly do not understand. How wild is that? If we only trade in the hardest money to ever exist, then... How can you determine a good idea and a bad idea and the Bitcoin uh, related question is like, why is Bitcoin such an amazing idea through that lens you gathered in failing and succeeding? Great question. Yeah, so in general, so I think if I share a bit about my background, like in, in, in the past 10, 10 years, I've been uh, really active in kind of what, I, yeah, I just always call it like new product development, but I've seen that from, uh, and then especially like in tech, like digital products and businesses, like I've seen that from um, lots of different, in, in lots of different roles, basically. So uh, like I started my career uh, at a tech investor. Uh, I worked at the Next Web, which is a big uh, media publication in, in tech. Um, I worked for Product Hunt. Uh, I had my own growth marketing agency. Uh, I've worked in traditional finance at two big banks. That's like an innovation coach where I like, guided the teams that were developing like new business uh, products. And so I've seen like new ideas from these roles. Um, and also, yeah, in different stages and from different 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 angles. And um, yeah, along the way, I also built my, out my own ideas. I also have an uh, online course called No Code MVP, where I teach people how they can validate their business ideas without knowing or learning how to code. Uh, which I think you know a lot of people think that they should actually be able to do that, but you should only build something if you know that you actually should, right? And so, what I explain to people is that. You know, I, and, and also what I believe is that ideas are abundant, right? Like there's a million trillion infinite ideas in, in, in the universe, basically. And when you have an idea of, of your own, I kind of see it as like you, you pick that, right? Like it, it comes to you at some moment. And at that moment, you kind of combine things you know or things that should exist or things you see other people did, et cetera. Like you combine that into a mix that is then eventually represented as, as your idea. But when you ask someone, you know, hey, tell me about your business idea, right? They always pitch something that is not yet existing and also already in the future, right? So I'm going to build uh, an app for these people and uh, they can do X, Y, Z and it's gonna, they're going to pay this amount of euros per month and I'm going to reach them in this marketing channel and grow like this or that or blah, blah. Like whenever someone pitches, it's basically a combination of all these assumptions about all these parts, basically, right? There's a problem. There's people with a problem uh, uh, or these people have that problem. This is how I'm going to solve it. It looks like this. I'm going to ask this amount of money, etc. But when you start uh, and you are not in the future with the thing that is finished, you first have to do activities to figure out if these assumptions are true, right? Because an assumption is basically a statement that you define as true, but if, uh, for example, there's no one with the problem you think people have, then why would you even build, you know, a, a technically difficult uh, product, basically? And that's also, by the way, the trap that a lot of people fall into, especially technical people. Actually, I have a blog post uh, on, on the Internet somewhere that's called knowing how to code is a trap because people who can code can also build the thing. So when they have the idea in their head, they, they just go on to building the thing. But then when they launch, they have a solution and they are basically looking uh, for people with a problem, which in the past 10 years, I've rarely <laughs> seen work, <laughs> almost never. Um, and that is just really hard. So it's very important that in the beginning, because you know each idea is a combination of all these assumptions, plus if there are an infinite amount of ideas, it's basically a numbers game to find an idea that works for you, right? So if you accept that it's a numbers game and also accept that it's a combination of assumptions, you have to challenge yourself at the point when, when you have this idea, okay, when would I find this interesting enough or how much proof do I need to actually continue with this idea and invest more time, money, and energy into it to 
you know, progress with, with the idea. Um, so how do you identify a good idea? It's actually understanding that when you have your idea, it's about a future big thing. Figure out how you can reverse engineer that to today. Like, what do I actually know today? What don't I know? What is important? What's not important? And the things that you don't know enough about, but are really important. For example, uh, an example I, I use a lot is um, one of the biggest assumptions in the beginning of the Uber app was that they could use um, like the Google Maps SDK, basically, so that they could uh, implement Google Maps into their app, which was not widely used at that moment, to actually you know show all the cars, uh, trans, trans um, or like send the location of the passenger, etc. And that was one of their biggest assumption and assumptions. And if that would not have been um, uh, workable, like uh, if they wouldn't have been able to to do that, then like the whole concept of being on a location as a passenger, being on a location as a driver, seeing each other, getting matched in the most optimal way, uh, would have would have never worked basically. So it's really important to when you think about your future idea to go back to today. And I always kind of say like identify three to five assumptions that you really have to find more proof for in order for you to be comfortable enough to to continue right and it's a very personal exercise actually because if you and i would have the same idea and the same assumptions and the same information and we would do the same things to gather more proof then even with the result we would still look at it differently right based on our risk appetite or our budget or you know what you know whatever makes me me and and you you basically so it's always really a personal decision and reflection on yeah also your own values and beliefs if you should continue uh, with an idea so what makes a good idea i don't know if there's a universal answer but if you talk in business terms right if there's no one with a problem, then it's going to be really hard to actually, you know, build a business or a product that serves a certain group uh, of people, especially nowadays, like building a building a digital product is becoming easier every day. But actually finding people or distributing it in, in the right way, that that is very hard, right? Because a lot of people are doing things and there's a lot of noise on the Internet. Um, so you can only succeed at that if you really know who you're targeting, whose problem you're solving, and if your solution also actually solves um, the problem. So my main advice always is go back to you know those three to five assumptions, set a time frame. Let's say the next eight weeks or the next twelve weeks, I'm going to investigate these assumptions, and if you know I get these results, then I'm going to continue. So so create like measurable. Uh, results that uh, that you can draw your uh, your conclusions from. So basically, when you when when we take an example, for example, like let's say I want to have the podcast and it should be like a really big one, and uh, I started out that uh, just try to okay, am I good in interviewing? Am I good in this? Like I, I like the assumption is oh I have to be good in interviewing. The next assumption is oh. Uh, uh, do I have enough listeners, audience, uh, and the next assumption is can I monetize on, on that? And uh, basically, if I do a lot of interviews and, uh, and, and like maybe like five, ten episodes, then I see, okay, I have this and that. Uh, as I gather some information or maybe I even monetization, like if, when YouTube starts monetizing or X starts monetizing, like I have one more proof point that maybe like a big company or sponsor pays me also. Uh, money like you just try to gather information from what is it in 20 years and how does this reflect in the in the present if i get it right yeah but it's also really contextual based on the idea right so for a podcast like i, I also started a, a podcast right like uh, i don't know two two three months ago uh, like a bitcoin podcast for me like I, I i don't have a lot of expectations my assumption is i know what i'm talking about I like talking to people. Uh, I can use this editing software. And one promise I made to myself is, this, is I'm going to keep, keep going. Like the main thing I think on YouTube and with podcasts that I read actually is, you know, the consistency is key, right? So you just have to keep doing it. Um, but I think in the context of a podcast, yeah, 
it's kind of like I, I think I can make something interesting and you think you can make something interesting, but it's eventually the people that decide if it's interesting, right? And it's the same with, you know, you can identify, uh, uh, if we talk about a business application, for example, we can, talk, we can identify a certain problem people have, but if it's not big enough, right? If, if they don't wake up in the morning and think like, you know, damn, how am I going to fix this? Then you can have your solution, but then still you are more, um, uh, how do you say that? Like uh, uh, painkiller versus vitamin. Like it's not, if if it's not uh, increasing someone's, uh, you know, value in life, then it's just not good enough. And so I think, you know, for a podcast in the context from, you know, we, we probably have different goals, but for me, it's just like, I'm going to continue doing this. And if it's good enough, I will get the signal that it's good enough from, from the people that listen. And I always think like, if you solve a, a problem or if you actually deliver value, then of course you can make a business out of it. Right. And, and by the way, like if you, uh, ma making a business is asking for money. Well, if you ask for money, you also should know what the value is that you bring. Right. And in a sale, I first talk about the sell the value that I bring before I ask for the money. So if I deliver value, if I know that people are happy in this context, you know, with my podcast, or you know that people are happy with your podcast, that means it's valuable, which means it represents money in some way, right? But in the context of a podcast, it could take a bit longer, I think, in general, because you have to establish, you know, your audience um, first. And also, you know, I think we are the same, learning how to talk <laughs> to other people and edit and all these, all these things. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, my goal for the podcast is just to learn and to connect with people and, yeah, I uh, think this and just broaden my Bitcoin network. I think this is also the, the best goal you to have for a podcast. It's like, uh, for me, it, it just came out spontaneous because I grew on X and I had more and more Zoom calls with, with Bitcoiners. And then there was like the idea that I want to have a video format because I saw that a lot of people know Robin Sire, but almost nobody knew my face. And so uh, I was like, I should have a video format if I actually want to, to have my face associated with Bitcoin. And yeah. then I also start, started, uh, I wanted to have uh, more Bitcoin conversations. So it was like just a, just a good um, uh, mix of that. And if we listen, uh, if, if we now look in Bitcoin with that lens of what's a good idea, what's yeah. the future yeah. assumptions, like why is Bitcoin now such an amazing idea that so many people are there making content for it, um, yeah. allocating yeah. capital to it? Yeah, I think it's because Bitcoin solves an actual problem, right? It solves the problem that what used to be money or what money should be, basically exchanging information between two people or two parties about the value that they exchange, right? Basically what I just said, I give you value in, I fix your roof and you give me value in return in whatever we deem is valuable, right? So if, when we talk about money, the, the people should decide what the money is, right? Like in prison, they decide that cigarettes are money uh, because they are scarce and people find them valuable even when they don't smoke, right? So that's that's interesting. Um, and so I think, you know, today on uh, January 3rd, we celebrate this first Genesis block, right? And the quote that is in there talks about the bailouts for the banks. And that is actually the problem that we have. The problem that we have is that the banks and the government manipulate the money, the technology that we use to exchange value. And the citizens are always, you know, the last to actually benefit, but also the first to, to pay, to pay for it. And that's a big problem. Although a lot of people are not aware of the fact that that is a problem. There are now a lot of people that do see that Bitcoin solves this problem because it's provably scarce. It's ultimately transparent, which totally changes the incentives for the not only the value of the money, but also kind of like the sustainability of that money. Like you can trust that in the future, 
this type of money will be the same, the same type uh, that I have right now will be the same type of money that I will have in the future. And when you compare that to the current situation, that is obviously not the case. So I think Bitcoin solves a real problem. What is very interesting, I heard, I was listening to a Dutch podcast and, and they were talking about the history of, of Bitcoin, right? And, and, and um, that Satoshi actually combined a lot of things together, right? And, and obviously also, you know, added, added his, own, uh, his, his own parts. But then they were talking about, is it a discovery or an invention? And someone said, it's a discovery from the future. And I thought it was actually really cool that, um, and I also saw a quote of Hal Finney today that he says, like, in order for Bitcoin to be valuable uh, or to work in the future, like, it has to have more value, right? It has to be worth more. And so what I find interesting there is that Hal Finney was very, very closely, uh, you know, um, connected with Satoshi and they exchanged the transactions, right? They were able to look at the current situation, apply years of uh, uh, research and their own insights and their own um, uh, yeah, their own insights to something new, but also look into the future and think about how how would this grow beyond our life, basically, and how can we apply that now? And they they basically solve that, which is crazy. <laughs> it's crazy, actually, right? If you look at any technological. Um, uh, any new technology that follows like this adoption, this S-curve, right? N nobody, uh, uh, none of the people involved with those technologies looked forward to how a certain adoption had to go in order for that technology to to stay relevant, right? And and be sustainable towards to, towards having an actual future. And and they did that. And that I think uh, is 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 astounding. Actually, that you you take that into into account and also kind of prepare for that and weave that into, for example, the issue uh, uh, the issuance schedule, basically, right? Like they 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 took that so uh, over such a long time that they also gave the people that amount of time to actually figure out how this would make their lives better. Yeah, I think, I think it's also really interesting when you think about startups and entrepreneurs and companies. Uh, the founder is usually very long there and, and drives the, the company. And like there's like uh, companies where the founder is still the CEO in like 25, 30 years. And Satoshi Nakamoto left really early. Like he, he moved on to another project or whatever uh, happened with him really early on. Uh, mm. This is something maybe you can share some insights, but from what I see with entrepreneurs and with startups, it's really unusual for an entrepreneur to leave so yeah. early and the project to live on and be so much bigger than he left it with. Yeah. Uh, that's actually an interesting thought to explore, right? Because I, I believe that for startups and new businesses, actually the founders have to do all the work in the beginning, all the acquisition, distribution, marketing, sales, they have to do that in the beginning in order to figure out what works for their product or business and what not before they brief or hire someone that will then eventually do that for them so that it becomes a scalable uh, uh, business. But yeah, when you compare that to Satoshi, who left <laughs> very, very early on, I think it's actually the quote, right? He says, I've moved on to other things or something or other projects. Yes. I, I, yeah, it's fascinating, actually, when I take those two, two well, w one thing that happened that Satoshi left, but also my belief that a founder has to help in that distribution. It's actually pretty incredible that a technological discovery or invention, I, I, use, uh, I say discovery, actually has real grassroots adoption by the the people who accidentally and sometimes on purpose found it and also adopted it started using it playing with it etc there's not a lot of things in history where that actually happens you know like a lot of things were pretty centralized in uh, in their development and rollout and, and etc et where this is completely just you know, literally like spaghetti on the wall or see what, you know, see what sticks. Um, 
now that I think about it. It's actually, it's a weird contrast because what I just said about like how crazy it is, how they implemented all these thoughts about its survivability towards the future and then just letting it go. Yeah. It's a big contrast, actually. I never thought, I never thought about that uh, before. It should not work in that way. Definitely. And maybe the fact that it works is is also like a sign that, you know, this is an actual thing. And I think for me, like I've I've been in Bitcoin for, for, for I first found it like in 2013. So so 10 years on and off, obviously, like every like everyone. Um but there are a lot of these types of moments actually that I now realize that there are certain signals along the way that you just cannot um you cannot fade right like it's 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 there are certain realizations along the way when you when you understand bitcoin where you're like okay if this is really like if this is really the thing you know after um just studying and thinking about it thinking about your own rationale like am i too bullish or too much in a dream world or whatever like like you know like really challenging yourself in the belief and your understanding about bitcoin sometimes you end up at a point where you think like yeah really like could it really be this and then it is right and 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 i think the conviction of a lot of people and the interest in bitcoin also comes from kind of like the accumulation of of these seemingly standalone points but then when you put them together you're like okay this is really this is more than money right this is a real society like a technology for societal change and fix the money fix the world and all and all these things like you you gradually go there but i think it's because you you gather like these little realizations i'd say along the way that um, yeah that this yeah. is just a really special thing and, and maybe the decentralization and uh, the grassroots movement that you described because Satoshi Nakamoto left so early and uh, it, he, he, he let it be and like he was like, I created it and it can live on its own if it does, because if the idea is strong enough, it will. Obviously, when you come from a startup and entrepreneur world, you, you know that you have to put in the work. Things don't work magically. <laughs> like you, yeah. you, even if the product is amazing, you still have to sell it. You still have to market it like nothing sells on its own. But Bitcoin is kind of the, the counterpart to it where it's actually kind of sells on its own because it's such a great idea and it's such an amazing invention where like, salespeople just jump on it and want to sell it like about it it's a yeah. it's an amazing thing um when... but, but for the philosophy of what bitcoin could be he had to go right and that is also i hope i i i don't know who it was like i always think it was hell finny but it's kind of weird if he would like email himself but maybe for like some obsec reasons it it, it could be a good idea but i i've I don't like, I hope this, well, it's weird. Like on one side, I hope this person is alive to actually see what this became or the people or the group, you know, some people say it's for, it was for people, but it's also good that we don't have a person to look at, right. A person to worship or look, look up to like people look at Zuckerberg or, or all these like Silicon Valley type people, because eventually this is not about person that that created it like the 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 anonymity of of satoshi nakamoto is what bit what actually makes bitcoin uh or gives bitcoin like a legitimate chance to become what we think it it can become right if if there was a person then it would it 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 would already be different the The whole point of bitcoin is to proof or actually help us the humans with our own corruptibility you know by giving us a ledger a technology where we can exchange value with each other to protect us from that corruptibility from uh, of ourselves and 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 of the people that we would exchange value with so it's very good that there's not another human attached to it because it would be very easy to attack that person and say uh, you you do it to become rich or whatever, like all these stupid arguments. So it's good that he's gone, but I I, I do hope that if, if this person is alive, that he could he or she could see it. Yeah, that's that's, that's true. Although I 
I think the, the chances of him or her or the group uh, being alive is really small, but um, like it's, it's, a, it's a crazy origin story, which we makes yeah. Bitcoin really original. Um, when did you, like you discovered first 2014, how did you discover it? Uh, yeah, so yeah, 2014, uh, yeah, basically a Vimeo video. I, I, re I maybe a friend said, I, I, I send it, I don't really know. I, it was a Vimeo video and it was called Bitcoin Explained. It's still up, but it's locked, so you cannot see it, which kind of sucks. Um, that was basically the first time it's really good, like animated explainer video of how Bitcoin works. And my first interest was kind of like what you hear, uh, like Jack Dorsey say a lot, like the internet should have a currency, like how the internet democratized, um, information, um, and connected us, you know, there should be a way to exchange value also directly. So how we are connecting now directly. We should be able to do that with with the currency, and so that's kind of what triggered me at first. Yeah, that that's just basically how I discovered it. Started reading about it. Uh, I bought it. I started sending with friends. It was just really fun that we had no clue like what this um, you know block scatter or blockchain page looked like with the fees and so like what the hell does, <laughs> does this mean? Um, yeah, I was just basically playing uh, playing around with it, and I think slowly. Over time, it's just, yeah, you start reading more, listening to other people, reading books. And um, I always say, like, I bought at like three, four hundred dollars. It's not to flex because I also sold at 4K, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, um, and, I, and I felt really great about it, actually. I now have less Bitcoin than I had before. So that's always I, I think you should always say that, like, uh, just do not sell. You will never you will never, you know, get it back. Um and I got out for a while and then I actually, uh, I found Ethereum at like $9 or something, which also really interests me. Um, you know, uh, this could be a decentralized computer applications, blah, blah. So I dove into that. I played the whole, uh, ICO casino. I played all the NFT stuff, uh, but slowly, yeah, uh, saw, I saw, and it's also because of my background, like. If we think about, you know, um, the ideas is, is a number numbers game, right? Investing in startups is, an, is a numbers game. Most ideas suck and that's fine, right? Like that's just the way it goes. But you have to figure out as quickly as possible if your idea actually sucks so you can move on to another idea and see if that sucks. And if not, then of course you continue with it, right? Um, so I saw like all these coins. I saw like all these ICOs. Everyone had a white paper, blah, blah. NFTs was the exact same thing as ICOs. But now instead of a white paper, people had a roadmap. So it was a, a, even like a, a, a lower threshold to to create a thing that other people could spend money on. And I mean, like, I'm all for new technologies and playing around, you know, mess, messing around. Uh, I, when I was 11, I had a computer. I burned CDs. I sold them in school. Uh, you know, st stuff like like that. Like people do that, of course. And and in a new technology wave, everything in the beginning is just total wild west. So I always kind of played around in it with viewing it also like that. Right? We are we are trying to figure out what works. But the longer I was doing that, the more Bitcoin came up as like this undercurrent of something that just kept doing the same thing basically and wasn't um, sensitive to all these you know very ephemeral ideas that just came and went and boom and bust and all the all these things and so i think around um like i'd say three four years ago uh, when I was in uh, after these ICOs, NFTs, I just started thinking, okay, I can dabble around in this wild west and and all this ETH stuff, but the whole goal is to to get more more Bitcoin. Uh, and I just started reading more books again on Bitcoin and watching stuff, and that is slowly moved everything uh, from all the all the ETH stuff to uh, to Bitcoin. So now I'm. Uh, now I'm 80% net worth in Bitcoin. <laughs> and the rest is cash. Yeah. So that's it. But but actually, and I have shared this previously as well on other podcasts, like what, what actually really got me is I was into Bitcoin. I was following it, you know, also a big percentage 
uh, already in Bitcoin. I worked at a bank. I was 30 and I worked at a bank uh, and I had a mortgage and uh, I was talking uh, with a colleague and he, and he said to me, did you know that the money in the bank is not yours? And I said, what? Like, what, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, yeah. So we had lunch for an hour and he explained to me like how fractional reserve banking worked and all these things. And then after that lunch, I was like, damn, I'm, I'm an idiot. Like I'm participating. I'm working at a bank. I'm working at a goddamn bank and I'm participating in a system. I have a mortgage and I have a bank account and I'm, I'm participating in a system that I truly do not understand. How wild is that? And I'm also into Bitcoin. Like I am, I, I have to, I don't know, fix my life. That's what I thought. Like I, I, I'm doing something and, and I have to, I have to fix this. Like I have to understand this and, and actually also have an opinion about it. That's really how I felt. Like I, I don't like to, um, do something that I don't understand. Like uh, it's kind of like, uh, I've tweeted about this once, like, uh, not like control freak, but I like to understand, right? Like if, if a guy comes here and fixes stuff in my kitchen, I like to watch because I, not to control him, but to understand what he's doing because I find it interesting in, in a sense. But then I also think like if I'm participating in, in a system or, or, um, and I don't understand it, then that sounds dangerous actually, right? Like that you give that control away to a third party or third parties that totally don't care about... Uh, uh, Bram Kahnstein, right? Like that's just, <laughs> yeah. And then, and so, so then I dove into more like the finance and economics dimensions of Bitcoin to actually understand that more. So that's kind of when I moved from, you know, technical internet, uh, kind of point of view on Bitcoin to more this, this economics and finance. And, uh, when I really went all in on Bitcoin was when I just realized, okay, I'm saving my wealth in a system that is probably, you know, not working and stealing from me. And I can move it to a system that is working for me where I'm way more sovereign. So I don't even see it as buying Bitcoin anymore. I just see it as I have value in system A that sucks and I'm just moving the value to system B that works. System yeah. B, pun intended. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's a crazy perspective because I, I think uh, that the thought that should come up to in my head is like people uh, when I speak with outside Bitcoin uh, normies uh, outside of the Bitcoin world they often say like yeah but I don't, don't understand it I don't have the time to research it and stuff like that but then I ask them like how's fiat working like <laughs> it's really, like i think fiat is way yeah, more it's complex. the same it's yeah they more... don't they don't know what they are participating in uh, they think they they think they know and they think that the people who decide about it actually uh, that it's legitimized that other people decide what the money you know i.e technology they use to exchange value with other people again what that should be worth. They, they, they don't understand that they actually legitimize it by not understanding it in a sense. Right. And, and I don't blame them. I mean, that was me again with a mortgage and working at a bank totally asleep. And it wasn't really like a problem or something that triggered me to dive into it. It was more the realization or, or that I luckily, you know, encountered, had an encounter with someone who, who explained that to me. But yeah, you cannot blame people that they 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 are asleep on this subject. That's of course the whole deliberate thing from the people that are actually in control of the money to not tell you about how the money <laughs> how the money works. That's the whole point. Yeah, it's a it's a crazy system. Um, we touched on it before. You you recently started a new podcast uh, where you talk about Bitcoin, Bitcoin for millenn millennials. Uh, you have a quite a big following also on on X. You have a newsletter. Um, what like what is the importance of having a like a completely different topic now from Bitcoin? But what is the importance of having a personal brand in the entrepreneurial scene and the uh, founding scene, uh, or like even broader, maybe even the career thing? Like, do do we all have to have a personal brand? Is social media like how does this change the whole landscape? Yeah. Good question. I think I didn't really like maintain my online brand for, well, maybe for the last year I did, but before that, I think for two, three years, I didn't, uh, I had a son a few years ago, I was taking care of him. I was just more, 
a bit less like career focus. So I kind of like didn't, uh, yeah, use already the following I had uh, before. Yeah, but I think it's really uh, essential. I think it shows that, um, you know, it's good, I think, to show what you do and what interests you, especially because, you know, nowadays, like on the internet, I think, I assume you went to college or university, you know, like, but but nowadays on the internet, maybe it's, except from like uh, astro, uh, being coming an astrophysicist or a doctor or something, like most, like 80% of subjects that uh, you could study for, right? Or, or, or get a job in, like you can find information about that on the internet. Um, but it's very important, I think, to show how you actually apply that, right? And, and even us making a podcast is also some form of proof of work, right? You have to do work to, to have a podcast. Um, and so it's really good if you can, if you can broadcast and show that, right? So not maybe in a classic way, like a portfolio that some people have, but it's, uh, you know, you're Robin and you're doing different things and you know, different things. And, um, yeah, I think it's important to, to establish yourself in a certain way that, so that people know what they can, um, talk with you about basically. Um, so yeah, I think the short answer is to just, uh, yes. And also, well, yeah. Now that I think about it, like for example, the people who work in banking, <laughs> they don't really have like online, online profiles where they showcase what they talk about. At least not not uh, not all of them. But I think it actually shows also curiousness, right? Like uh, I'm just rambling a bit, but I'm thinking about like these guys from Wall Street that we now follow around the ETF, uh, you know, or the or, or certain types of analysts. Uh, um, I found Fred Krueger. Do you know Fred Krueger? I heard about him, but I did not. Uh... Yeah, I just recently discovered him. But this is also a guy who's like 30 years in Wall Street and like a trader. And he now is just sharing his thoughts on Twitter. I don't know for how long, but I just recently discovered him. But I think, you know, especially people from that world, um, they didn't need or want, I'd say want probably, um, you know, like an online brand, etc. But now you see that they can actually connect with people outside of their old bubble because they really bring something new um, to online communities, you know, like on, on, on X. So uh, yeah, again, I think the shorter answer is yes, but especially um, maybe especially for people who come from like specialist um, um, careers or, or jobs, you know, like it's, it's especially a great opportunity, I think for them to, to establish their, their personal brand online. Yeah, I agree. Like um, having a brand, I think it's it's it, like just speaking about what you are passionate about is uh, an, an amazing experience. And having the feedback also, like I also learn a lot about uh, Bitcoin itself. Like I started uh, posting on on X just just this year in general, like with like four hundred followers, and and just learning about it and just uh, dealing with it. That you get a lot of good feedback also from the community. It's uh, I, I like it a lot. Yeah. Um, we having an end routine on the podcast, uh, where the previous guest asked a question for the, for the next guest. And it, uh, it's, uh, about Bitcoin and fiat culture. Um, what is the main difference for you? And it's especially a good question actually for you because it's, uh, you, you, you can talk about your banking, uh, in the past, uh, what is the main difference for you between Bitcoin culture and fiat culture? Well, one of the things I, I. I love and now also kind of see in my own life is, you know, this, this short, short term time preference and long term time preference that Safe Dean talks about. Like if you, if you move the wealth that you have from a system wherein you constantly have to take risk and mitigate, you know, the, the, the debasement of the currency that you use to, to store your wealth, then you are constantly busy doing that. And if you're not interested in doing that, you know, or it's, if it's not particularly your, your skill, then you have to outsource it or have some sort of advisor or whatever, like it occupies your brain and, and energy that you have. But when you move that wealth to a system that 
once you understand it and see it, you know that the wealth that is here now will be there in the future in the same way or more, then that gives you a lot of new space in your head to actually think about, you know, what are the things that I find important or what do I want to spend time on? And I think that can cover a broad range of subjects from, uh, I, th I think I once said like, also just like, what do I want to spend money on or money that I have? Right? Like I have, I don't know, I, I like sneakers and sometimes I see new sneakers and I think like, oh, I want to have them. But then I think like, no, fuck, fuck, fuck no. And then I just, for that amount, I just buy Bitcoin now. Uh, just because I know that the sneakers won't bring me the, the, um, what I think I want to get by buying the sneakers, right? Like kind of this little dopamine hit or, or whatever. So if I think about, oh, I want to buy these sneakers, then, well, apparently I have two or $300 or euros left over. I'd rather save that towards the future for my family, for my child to sustain myself, etc. Right. So I, I, I feel it shifts your perspective from actually a pretty narrow view where you consume without understanding why you're actually doing that to actually a very broad perspective where you're very conscious about what you want to spend your time, energy and, and money on. And, um, yeah, I think, I, I, I think that's great. And also I think, uh, we talked about this in the space with, uh, Alessandro, um, on Monday, the, the difference between, we talked about, uh, I think it was stock trading and I realized that, you know, when people do stock trading or, uh, Forex or all this, all this stuff, like you're basically playing against other people. You're trying to figure out like what would other people do with the information that I see now? Or there's this uh, big, uh, there's this famous quote about, I think, uh, uh, Bernanke, like this old, I think he was the Fed director, um, was like at this party and someone asked like, are you sick? And then he says, I cannot say that if I'm sick or not, because that would crash the market or something, right? Like all these little nonsense things where where you're like playing with the interpretation of information of other people. And then these people are playing with each other to trade and stuff like that. Well, we saw it in Bitcoin today, big, uh, long <laughs> liquidations, you know, in Bitcoin, you play against yourself. You play against your first to understand Bitcoin. You, you play against yourself in terms of like uh, challenging your ego, understanding that you don't understand everything, understand that things that you learned before, aren't true understanding what is actually true actually integrating that and operate in a different way now that you understand that you know the world works in a different way and then you keep playing this game against yourself when you when you hold bitcoin so it's not it's not i see it more as like personal development instead of you winning and someone else losing and uh uh, well, I, I hope that makes sense, but that's for me is really the different, right? Like it, it feels like again, narrow point of view, very short term time focus to way broader view, way more conscious and way more long term focus. So it feels more like building versus consuming in a sense. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it when you said like when when you are on a Bitcoin or sound money standard, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, financial energy. Like you don't have to be a f uh, in investment portfolio manager on the side next to your I don't know lawyer or doctor or whatever. Job. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> yeah. You, you you can focus on what you want, uh, what you are good at, and uh, also like a big thing as you said, the time preference. Like when when the money is getting more worth over time, like you. You have a like you get money and you have the decision by the sneakers today or maybe can I wait like half a year longer? Uh, in half a year, money will be more worth on a sound money standard, so the uh, sneakers will be actually cheaper. On a in, on a fiat standard, on a fiat culture, you're like this. If I don't spend it today, the money will be worth less, and the sneakers will be. Uh, more expensive like people are incentivized to spend faster and and, and, and more mm -hmm. so that's yeah. uh, that that will uh, it will be interesting to see how this changes but also people are incentivized to 
yes, build versus consume, right? They're incentivized to create value because if what you can receive as value, right, in the value transaction is the hardest money to ever exist, then you are basically forced to also deliver actual value, right? So you can, you deserve to be compensated in that hardest money to ever exist. Today, I was listening to uh, Jimmy's song with Robert Breedlove, I think, and an episode, it was wild. Jimmy song shared that the first uh, Boeing, seven, the, the 747, the big one, from plan to first delivery or production, start of production, I'm probably butchering it a bit, but let's say from ideation to first production or first production delivery was 20 months. The second, like, bigger iteration on the 747 took, like, 10 years. <laughs> Wild. And that is because if if you are incentivized to, uh, he, I think he calls it a rent seeker, right? Yeah. To profit from other people that are actually trying to deliver value in still a broken system. And you don't have to do that, but you can still live in some way. Yeah, then why would you deliver value? But if we only trade in the hardest money to ever exist, then the competition will be fucking fierce. And you have to do something. You cannot be a rent seeker anymore. And yeah, that's just, uh, I, I find that very interesting thought. Because I do, but like it sounds maybe a bit scary. Like you have to, you have to deliver value. You have to do stuff. But you can also deliver value by cooking or cleaning or whatever. Like everyone has their own set of skills and interests and stuff like that. So it's not about who is better than another person. It's about actually doing what you love and not being forced to do something you don't like. Uh, because in the short term that you need to earn, uh, you know, broken money, <laughs> you, you, have to broken, you have to do stuff you don't like. But in a sound money system, I think... At least conceptually, I follow this train of thought where I think then you are actually incentivized to do and figure out and then do what you're actually really good at. Because that will be the only way where you will get fair, fairly compensated for the fair, fair value that you deliver. And now it's not the case. It's not the case in the lower class and it's especially not the case in the, in the upper class. There's a lot of people that don't add value that earn uh, 300k a year. And that's, yeah. uh, that's the whole point of broken money or fiat money versus sound money or Bitcoin is money. Yeah, everybody has to deliver his proof of work. They, they are no longer uh, rent seekers. Um, to end yeah. up the podcast, um, where can people find your proof of work? Um, yeah, people can follow me on uh, Twitter, X at Bramk, B-R-A-M-K. You can find Bitcoin for Millennials on Spotify, Apple, uh, YouTube, etc. And um, my um, uh, my company website is constein.co.co, and uh, there can uh, there people can see uh, what I do, how I work with companies, and uh, also work with me. So yeah, thank you for for doing it, Bram. Thanks for having me, and uh, all the best with uh, with your podcast, man. I'm gonna follow with uh, lots of attention. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Cheers.